Has anybody else still not come to grips with the fact that the Duke basketball season is over? Is that just me? Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you for being here with me today on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Lockdown Blue Devils is your one stop shop for everything going on in the life of Duke athletics. And of course, in Duke country, we talk a lot about Duke men's basketball, and we love doing that each and every day. That being said, I still have not quite come to grips with the fact that this Duke basketball season is over. It'll definitely sink in. On Saturday, when we're all gathered around watching the Final Four, one of our favorite events each and every year in college basketball, and it's NC State taking the hardwood instead of Duke. we got to talk about that with our good buddy Josh Cox, who's back with us once again uh, to recap the end of the year. It's going to be a really fun conversation. If you have not done so already, please be sure to follow and subscribe to Lockdown Blue Devils for free wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Please leave us a five-star rating and written review. Really appreciate your support in regards to leaving those reviews for us. Uh, also, make sure you watch the show each and every day on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button to our channel. Like this video. Uh, comment down below what you want to see in terms of off-season content. And we'll be sure to talk about those things in the days and weeks to come. We celebrated reaching the 2,000 subscriber milestone this Duke basketball season. And I'm thankful for you the listener, the watcher, whoever it may be, uh, for making that happen. Now we're on the road to 3,000 subscribers and excited to do all of that. Enough talking. Let's get down to business. Let's welcome him on in. Our very good friend, Josh Cox, for Duke Football Talks Section 17 podcast. And, of course, a full season's worth of basketball content over at Duke Report. Josh is here with us today. Uh, are you like me, Josh? Have you uh, been able to quite come to grips with the fact that the Duke season's over? Uh, certainly it's, it's still pretty fresh, you know, been just been a, a couple of days, few days now, but um, you know, it's, it's crazy to think, I mean, you, you, you expect NC state uh, that run at some point in time to be over, right. You expect them to, to not hit, hit the shots, right. You expect, you know, foul trouble or something, you know, to get in the way and uh, boy, it didn't happen uh, Sunday. It just did not happen. And, you know, Duke goes to the Elite Eight for the fourth time in the last five seasons, um, but just can't get over the hump and can't make it to the Final Four. And was really looking forward to a Purdue matchup that I think would be very, very interesting for Duke. Um, and it didn't happen. And so, I mean, congratulations to NC State, right? That's, that's all you can really say. There was no fluff in that game. They absolutely won it. And, I mean, you got to give them all the credit. I have no clue where this came from, but. They're 9-0 in their last yeah, nine. So. They're, they're making it work. So credit to the Wolfpack for finding ways to win that game. We've talked a lot this week about that <laughs> game, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it with you here, Josh. And uh, I think the overwhelming takeaway from folks in our discourse this week and from what I've been reading uh, and also observing on social media platforms, I think a lot of it can go back to that first half. As wild as it is to say, Duke's winning at halftime by six. In prior games against NC State, at halftime of the win in Raleigh, they were only winning by three. And their loss in the ACC tournament, they were down by three. It's a six-point margin for the Blue Devils at the break. Uh, and in yet so many ways, we can look back at that first half as being a bit of a, a difference maker there. Are you in agreement? Or what are your thoughts when you look at that first half of play? Well, I mean, certainly the first half of play, you have to look at the, uh, the defense from Duke was just – what we have been used to here in the last few games. So credit there. But on the offensive side, I mean, the disappointment lies in the fact that Duke could not just get it, get anything going at all. And, I mean, credit NC State's defense. They played well. Um, but Duke absolutely could not get an offensive rhythm, could not get an offensive flow. Um, I believe it was in the first half. I mean, it could be early in the second half, but I believe it was the first half. There was a possession where I believe Tyrese Proctor – you know, dribbled the ball 17 times, 
and threw up a, a fadeaway, you know, 18 foot jumper as the clock, shot clock expired. And it's like, that's unacceptable at this stage of the, of the season. Like, you cannot stand around on offense, watch a dude that has no business playing hero ball, play hero ball. So, yeah, I, I, the, the offense in the first half was disappointing. But to your point, JJ, going into halftime Sunday night, up six, you know, my thought is, man, DJ Burns is not going to keep doing this. There's no way, right? And there's no – and they haven't been shooting the ball well. They've been playing solid D. And, like, and so we're going to be fine. It's going to be just like Raleigh. We're going to end up winning by 15, right? That's what's going to happen. And, man, if, if we didn't come out and, and couldn't throw the ball in the ocean, couldn't get a good shot, and they they went on that run, and they couldn't miss. And, um, yeah, it just goes to show you, man, you can't – you know, it's a full 40-minute game, and you got to come to play for all 40. Duke made more free throws than shots from the floor, as we're looking at the box score mm-hmm. once again here if you're watching with us on YouTube. 21 made free throws for the Blue Devils. They only made 19 shots from the floor. They only made five three-point jump shots, and all five made by Jared McCain. Duke shot five of 20. He had several in the last two and a half minutes of the game. He had three of them in the last two and a half. Hit two threes early, did Jared McCain, and then hit three threes very late. Prior to the barrage late by Jared McCain, as Duke's just trying to play, a little bit of catch up. The previous season low for Duke was four three point makes in a game that happened three times the season. We were in real danger of seeing that happen once and again uh, in a game like this that Duke could have had a career or a season low and a number of three point makes from the floor. Just no shot yeah. making ability at all for this team. Yeah, I agree. And I know, uh, I know you have some sports betting partners, and it's obviously uh, now um, uh, legal in North Carolina. So I had. A buddy of mine watching the game Sunday night that had Tyrese Proctor over four and a half threes. And so the one little bit of like, you know, caring about the last minute and a half of the game when 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 uh McCain, it was I think I said Proctor, when McCain hit his fifth, like he went nuts. He was like, and he I mean, at that point it's like he had already conceded the loss. Uh and so as a Duke fan, but he got he won some money on on McCain hitting that fifth three. But you're right. I mean, Jeremy Roach didn't he couldn't get open, uh, and and I don't, I don't even know, man. It was an odd game for him. As good as he was in the Houston game, I felt like he didn't. He was not able to get that mojo going in this game. Did not get open looks from three. Uh, Proctor was terrible, scoreless. Like I mean, I had no other way around that. It was a yeah. terrible game. And then, you know, TJ Powers worked his worked his way out of the rotation. So there's another three point threat. It's not there. Filipowski wasn't hitting. So, I mean, yeah, it, was, it was it was a rough day for me out of the arc, for sure. Even the shooting struggles went to Mark Mitchell, right? And the fact that yeah. Mark didn't even take them. There were a couple of possessions where Mark Mitchell is wide open on the perimeter, NC State daring him to shoot the basketball and doesn't take the shot. Does he make them? Who knows? This season uh, was a regression from three-point percentage for Mark Mitchell than it was in his freshman year. But I found that even odd, right? And Jeremy Roach didn't have as many open looks or open opportunities. But how many times have we seen a Duke game where Roach walks away only attempting one three-point yeah. basket? Duke was the best three-point shooting team in the ACC this season, one of the best in the country. And to not take attempts throughout the course of the game was really kind of puzzling to me. Yeah, I, you're, you're right. And once again, I, I guess you have to credit NC State's defense. I mean, Duke sure. was not necessarily getting the open looks. And, you know, there were a couple. I, I believe Filipowski was foul, fouled by, I believe, Middlebrooks on one in the corner. Like, obvious that the referee, if you watch the referee, he got caught ball watching, yep. which referees are not supposed to be doing. Um, he completely missed that. That's no excuse. I'm not saying anything about the officiating have anything to do with the, in the result of this game, but just shooting specifically, that's one where I was like, you know, maybe that goes in if he doesn't get fouled. I don't know. It, you know, there, there was there was never a point in this game where I started feeling confident on the offensive end for Duke. Never. Um, first half, second half, not at all. Defense, first half, I was very confident that Duke could continue to keep them at bay, but it obviously didn't work for the second half. 
DJ Burns and NC State play on. Duke basketball sees their season come to a close. Just a very uh, kind of frustrating turn of events for the Duke basketball uh, team as the season is over. Let's continue this conversation with our good pal Josh Cox, and we'll talk about a few other things after we take our first time out here on today's show. Lockdown Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends, Amazon's Fire TV, your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all of the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, Major League Baseball, and more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash LockedOnFireTV. Let's keep it moving here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. J.J. Jackson joined today by my good friend Josh Cox from Duke Football Talk Section 17 podcast in the Duke Report. We're talking about the end of the year for the Duke men's basketball team. Season is over, and now we get a little bit of perspective. Both years under John Shire have finished with identical records of 27 and 9. How do you sum up this season for Duke? I see a lot of frustrated fans out there throwing the word failure out for a team uh, that was preseason, one of the top teams in the country, along with Kansas. But I can't quite get there, Josh. I have a really hard time calling this year a failure. Yeah, maybe this will be an opportunity for a rant for me. But like, Go for it, please. Duke, Duke fans are absolutely – some Duke fans are absolutely delusional. I've never seen a fan base be so critical – of their other basketball players, of the coaching staff. Like, it's it's ridiculous. I was explaining it to somebody earlier this week. <clears throat> you look at these stat lines and realize that Jared McCain is a true freshman. You realize Kyle Filipowski is a sophomore. Back in the glory days, you know, back when guys stayed three and four seasons, look at these guys' stat lines compared to those greats in their first season or their first and second season. And you'll find some eerily similar stat lines. You'll see that Kyle Filipowski and Christian Leitner in their second seasons in, in Durham had like basically equal stat lines. So like, I, I swear to God that there are some young fans, if the 1992 Duke team was playing right now, they'd be critical of the 1992 Duke team. <laughs> so number one, Duke fans are so spoiled rotten, they need to get over it, number Fair. one. Elite eight, that means... That means there are only – right now there are only four other teams in the country that are still playing basketball. So basically, if you made the Elite Eight, you're tied for fifth in the country, a four-way tie. I believe, J.J., and I could be wrong, about two weeks ago I, – I, I believe I said it to you online. I may, it may have been our conversation offline. But I said, man, if this team can make it to the second weekend, just get to the Sweet 16 – this is a successful season. Listen, Duke does not have a rim protector, a rim protecting big. Like, and they beat Houston without a rim protecting big. Kyle Filipowski, for any criticism that dude gets, he manned up in that Houston game and played some incredible basketball. So is this season as successful as Duke fans expected it to be heading into the season? Maybe not. Maybe this, maybe you were a Duke fan and you're like, this is a national. National title or bust. If that was you, fine. But like logic says, this team made the Elite Eight. This team fought through lineup struggles. You mentioned it shooting wise. Mark Mitchell, I would argue his entire game digressed a little bit to the second in his second season. Yeah. Um, you fought, you had the Caleb Foster injury, a weird one that no one's talking about, but you lost 
of depth in the bigs with Christian Reeves all season. You didn't have anybody that could come in seven foot one and spare you five fouls. Uh, you didn't have that. And so for this team to go on and do what they did, uh, the emergence of Jared McCain and just his overall spirit and personality, like this was absolutely a successful season. John Shire is doing an incredible job. Um, he's a different coach. Guess what? He's not going to rip his shirt off and throw it at the official and lose his mind and get technical fouls. That's not his game. It's not what he does. And so we, we do fans need to stop asking for it or stop wanting it. It's not going to happen. So is this a successful season? Yes. Do Duke fans need a little bit of like 30,000 foot perspective? Absolutely. I mean, if we're being honest, next year is, if you want to put the expectations on Duke next year, I got, I'll, I'll give it to you. Yeah. Next year, national championship or final four or bust next year. Sure. But this season, I mean, you had to be honest with this roster and say that, that you were going to, I didn't think it was going to be NC state. <laughs> but you were going to face somebody. I would have. I would have said Houston. But you're going to face somebody that could just beat you up down low, and Duke was not going to win the game. And I, I would counter that. Look, the national championship is the standard every single season when you play for a program like Duke. But that being yep. the standard doesn't mean not reaching it results in a failure. Coach K is Correct. the greatest to ever do this, and in 42 years, he only reached that standard. Five times. Yep. 12%. 12% of 42 years for the first guy who's ever done it before. The best guy, I should say, to ever do it. So more times than not, it is going to end in a little bit of disappointment. Yes, Duke's yes. got an amazing recruiting class coming in, and we'll see who returns. And that's going to be plenty of offseason conversation to carry us over eight months until we get to see Duke basketball play again. We're going to have a whole lot of fun with it, Josh, but – yeah, it, it is good to kind of have a little bit of a reality check that we want to win championships every year. At a school like Duke, you can win a national championship every year. But there have been really good teams who didn't get over that hump. And there have been Duke teams who won a title that, you know, probably weren't the best team all season. But that kind of goes into a bigger picture question about the NCAA right. tournament tournament format and all that. Well, and that's, that's where I was heading. I mean, look at Duke's five titles. In 1991 – they pull off the one of the biggest upsets in college basketball history and yeah. being UNLV. In 1992, listen, the Coach K legacy is not what it is. If Grant Hill does not make that pass in the Elite Eight to Christian Leitner and Christian Leitner does not hit that shot. Trying. If 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 Kentucky puts a man on the ball on Grant Hill, or if they front and sandwich Christian Leitner, that doesn't happen. So uh, uh, 2015, Wisconsin beats undefeated Kentucky. In the semifinal, so Duke doesn't have to play Kentucky. Yeah, Duke's not beating that Kentucky team. So, like 2010, as much as we love that team, I love that team. There's you can't honestly say that was the best team in the country. Yeah, that won the national title that season. I mean, what uh, Duke was about what an inch away from that Gordon Hayward, you know, launch <laughs> going in anyway. So all that to say, I'm not discrediting anything Duke did. 2001 run, the Maryland games anyway. But not discrediting anything Duke's done, what I'm saying is the ball has to bounce your way. I don't care if you're the best team in the country or not. The ball's got to bounce your way during the tournament. There is a lot of skill that goes into it, a lot of coaching that goes into it. But then at the end of the day, there's a lot of, like, fortune that happens, good fortune that happens to the teams that win, and the ball rims out on teams that don't win. And so, like, you know, at the end of the day, I believe John Shire is doing a great job. Um are there improvements? Look, he would, he would, if he was on this podcast with us, he'd be the first one to raise his hand and be like, absolutely, there are improvements. Let me go down the list of what we need to improve on. Yep. He's not dumb. There obviously needs to be improvements. Um, but he's patient. He handles this team a little differently. Honestly, he handles this team more like a 2024 head coach would handle a team than a 1992 head coach would handle a team. But it's 2024. It's not 1992. And so I'm I'm still 100% on the Shire uh, train. He won an ACC championship last year, made it to the Elite Eight this year. Um, and, and I just keep progressing. Keep I progressing. love John Shire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely the right man for the job. No need to panic. No need to make a switch. And, no. again, we're grateful that, the to your point, the ball's got to bounce your way sometimes. And 
Heck yeah, man. It's bounced Duke's way five times uh, yeah. since the 90s. That is outstanding. And they've had it plenty is. more opportunities to go to a Final Four. We were there two years ago. Look at this year's Final Four footprint. In the Elite Eight this past weekend, we watched Clemson and Alabama, who have been playing basketball for a really, really long time. Yeah. One of them was going to win, and one of them was going to go to their first ever Final Four, and it's Alabama who does that. Purdue hasn't been there in 44 years. NC State hasn't been there in 41 years. And then you've got a team like UConn who's done this a time or two, so they get to go back to the dance this year. Great. Job well done. But, I mean, it's hard, man. And hell yeah, I I wouldn't want to be a fan of any other college basketball team or program. I love that we're Duke guys. Uh, and, and let's celebrate a little bit of the success and know that there are going to be some years where, guess what, a Mercer happens right. or a Lehigh happens. Lehigh happens, yep. Yep. Well, think about think about the power of one play. One Virginia free throw in the ACC tournament. If they hit a free throw, yeah. none of this happens for NC State. Right. None of it. Virginia just closes the game out properly. It's, it's ball game. It's over. And, like, that one play – has now begun like a domino effect of NC State winning nine games in a row and going to the Final Four. Very easily, Virginia wins that game in the ACC tournament, and the whole narrative is is completely different. Kevin Keats is fired. Gary Hahn's on his vacation uh, for for NC State. He's retiring at the end of the season. I swear my man has had to push back his vacation now three three weeks. and I think it's going to be a sport that he can push it back. But congratulations to him. But, like, it's just the power of, like, one play. And I think that's where maybe sometimes as fans is warranted the frustration of, like, the small details of the game where you feel like certain teams or certain players whiff a little bit because it's like, hey, that could have been that one play, right? That could have been the one play that shifted the tide. And so, anyway, but it it is – at the end of the day, I'm not a big luck guy, but I I, I do believe that like ball goes in, man, he's a good yeah. coach. We uh no kidding. You know? we, we've we've got one more break to get to, but before we get there, I gotta ask you one more because we're we're playing out these scenarios and yep. obviously I, I'm with you each day of the week, Monday to Friday, not able to talk uh, after the sweet sixteen win over Houston. Josh, yep. what happens if Jamal Shedd doesn't roll his ankle? Great question. I mean, listen, I, I mean, I think Duke fans, um, I mean, obviously we're without Caleb Foster, right? So, I yeah. mean, I, but, but that's apples and oranges as far as like impact on the team, even though Caleb is very important to Duke. Um, that's an all American we're talking about. <laughs> it is, it is. And an all American who, while Duke was playing with them, it was obvious when he, when he left the game that Duke was able to extend that lead and able to push out a little bit. So, I think it's a, it's a great analogy, JJ. Like, sure, Duke was on the, on the fortunate side of a twisted ankle in the, in the sweet 16 game. Uh, just like, you know, there's been injuries in the past. I mean, I crazy, but think back to that Louisville game uh, back when Kevin Ware had yep. the compound fracture, like, but the, I think they ended up turning that around. I think Louisville won that game, if I'm not mistaken, but, yeah. uh, but, but anyway, you know, it's just all, all a matter of like little thing happens here. A little thing happens there and you have a really successful season or your fans are mad and, you didn't live up to expectations. Let's go Duke. I love it, man. I love <laughs> it. 27 and nine on the year, a trip to the elite eight. And we got to continue this conversation after we take uh, our final time out here on today's episode of locked on blue devils. What a fun chat we're having again with our good pal, Josh Cox, who joins us here today. We'll be back in just a moment. All right. Locked on blue devils here today is brought to you by America's number one sports book. And our absolute favorite. That's right. We're talking about FanDuel. The sports calendar right now is loaded. The Final Four coming up this weekend. Major League Baseball is in full swing. Those NBA playoffs are right around the corner. So tons of conversations about the NBA playoffs coming soon with my good buddy Josh Cox. Uh, But right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 when you can bet on the MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet a big win. Again, FanDuel is America's number one sports book. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, a proud sponsor of Locked On Blue Devils. 
All right, let's close down this episode of Locked On Blue Devils. My name is JJ Jackson. His name is Josh Cox. We talk about Duke throughout the year. Unfortunately, another season has come to a close. We'll get into more individual player reviews after the season takes place like we've done in previous years. But just fresh thoughts, uh, again, Josh, if you will, on, on kind of some of the individual parts that made up the sum that yeah. was Duke basketball in 2023-2024, if you will. Well, a couple of things stand out to me. Um, number one, five guys in double figures. Um, the starting five, basically. Uh, that's impressive, um, for sure. Um, I think that Kyle Filipowski's stat line, given the expectations that were on him preseason and given the fact that I will not belabor my point, but I've, it's been all over Twitter, the fact that I believe he's been playing out of position on both ends of the court, and he's still putting up 16.6 and eight and, a half, eight and a half rebounds a game. So, you know, I got you got to give him credit. And then I believe uh, um, Jared McCain coming back. So his season started low. He got really, really, really hot, came back down to earth, but he picked it back up again. If I'm not mistaken, I believe, and it might actually be on here, I believe, yeah, it is. He's, he finished the season shooting over 41% from three. Um, and so like, those are the things that come out to me. And then I think we, we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge, you know, this is not really the NC state game, but that Houston game, I think Duke fans have to acknowledge the clutch performance of Jeremy Roach and just how, you know, how tough that kid is in like late game situations. So those are the things that come to my mind, the balance scoring, you know, flip McCain, those guys. No doubt. I mean, just different people contributing all throughout the course of a season like this. Duke had a couple of uh, All-American seasons with, with Kyle Filipowski. And, of course, Flip was All-ACC. Jeremy Roach was honored. Third team All-ACC. Jared McCain was snubbed of being the conference uh, rookie of the year. Yep. Really good stuff from this Duke basketball mm -hmm. team. Uh, that set to, to kind of wind down again on the episode today, there were a couple of players that we might have conversations about. You know what? Maybe their season didn't live up to yeah. what we wanted it to be. Talking about a, a pair of sophomores who came back and, and Tyrese Proctor and Mark Mitchell. I know those are the most popular names uh, that are being discussed right now and what their futures may be. We'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, I want to hear from you, Josh, the, the seasons yep. that Mitchell and Proctor had. Yeah, you, you expected, or at least I expected, Mark Mitchell to come back and have a little bit more of a polished game. Um, you know, you expect these guys over the offseason, you know, to identify certain elements of their of their individual games and improve upon it. Um, and I, I didn't see that trans translate onto the court for Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even the shots that he made in the lane a lot of times were so like unorthodox and like, like, I don't know, like the timing was off. Like he almost traveled all the time. And like, I, it was just very odd to me. I don't know what it is, but, it, but Mark got every opportunity from John and the coaching staff this year. I mean, there were, you know, there was a time there where everyone was calling for like, we don't want to see Mark Mitchell anymore. <laughs> um, and so I thought that was interesting. Tyrese, man, I don't, I don't know. You see flashes, right, JJ? Like, you'll see a play that he makes that's like that right there is why NBA scouts love him. But then he'll disappear, aka Sunday night against NC State with no points, over five from three. Uh, so the inconsistency for Tyrese Proctor, I don't know what you attribute that to. Uh, I, I really don't. I don't know what his next step. I don't know what Mark Mitchell's next step is. I have no idea. Um, I, I don't believe Marks is to the league, so I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, I think Tyrese is 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 an NBA player. I just don't know what his path is going to be to get there. Um, so that's interesting. And then I think another person that I scratch my head at this season is Ryan Young. In every statistical category, he digressed. Yeah, my, my man can't make a free throw. Like I don't understand. Like. Uh, so, I mean, while he had a great game against Houston, don't get me wrong. If you look at the season, it's, it was just – it was a little bit mind-boggling. And so, I don't know what that is. I don't know if, if – I'm not blaming Duke in any way, but, like, does there need to be a little bit more of, like, a uh, intentional player development process that happens 
throughout you know the off season. Does Duke need to set these guys up with like personal trainers and coaches from outside of the program? You know what I mean to work with these guys. You know I know that obviously your 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 high level guys like Jason Tatum came into Duke already with Drew Hamlin, right? So like, yeah. uh, I don't. I'm not saying that 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 Duke's got to go out and get Drew Hamlin on all these guys, but I mean, you know, does Mark Mitchell have a plan? from this season to next season and the specific areas he's supposed to get better at and who is, who is in his life that's going to make sure that happens. So those are the questions I have. And I, I know this is not the show for it, but it'll be very interesting to see what that roster looks like. You know, no kidding. Yeah. And we're going to have a lot of time to talk about oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the national championship continues to loom out there on uh, Monday. Of course, this upcoming Monday, of course, we'll see yep. the title game after Saturday's final four games, and then uh, after Monday, I think we're really going to start to see a whole lot of things moving uh, yep. with the basketball team. i got to switch it up on you. I'm going to interview you real quick as we close out. Yeah. What do you have? Well, who you got? You got Alabama and uh, Alabama and UConn. Who you got winning that? Who you got NC State for new? And then who you got winning it all? It, it's it's uh, no secret. I'm an Auburn alum. I do not have an affinity for the University of Alabama whatsoever. I think UConn is by far – the best team in college basketball, Josh. But I will say, if there is a team that I think can beat UConn, it's Alabama because mm-hmm. the way they play basketball is like you're watching an NBA team out there yep. on the floor. Yep. Nate Oates has shooters everywhere. And if they go on an absolute heater and UConn is off by just a little bit, I'm worried, man. I'm, I, I can't have Alabama win that basketball game. Yeah. Oh guy. I think UConn is still able to get it done. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think Purdue's going to be able to uh, – the Burns and Eni thing is so intriguing yeah. and appealing. Um, so I'm really excited to see how that one unfolds. But so yeah, I'd Purdue, say UConn, UConn. Purdue. Okay. Uh, and then I, I think UConn does become our okay. first repeat champs. So Yeah, I, I can get down with that. I What I told someone is UConn is not going to get beat. Yeah. If UConn loses, they're pulled a Duke, and they didn't show up and they didn't hit shots. Yeah. It's not going to be because some team went out there and actually beat them. UConn just didn't do something right, right? I mean, they're that good. So as much as I like Alabama, and I, I made a little bit of money uh, for them to even get to the Final Four, I had them there. Uh, I, I, I'm going to go with you on that. I'm going to go UConn. I'm going to go – I'm going to keep the streak alive, man. I'm going NC State. I know <laughs> I know Zach Eady is probably going to score 36 points and, and Purdue's probably going to blow them out. But I got to stay true to my friends in Raleigh. Uh, and give them respect. I'm going to send them to the title game, and then they're going to get beat by 40 uh, by UConn. Yeah, I, I'd love to see a great title game, but uh, I don't know that that's going to be in the cards. If Purdue and UConn right. could be a great yeah, title game. Sure, it could be, but NC State and UConn will not be. Sure. Uh, so, but we'll see what happens. I, I'm in the any anybody but Alabama boat is, uh, is where JJ Jackson resides. But <laughs> with that being said, see you gave you gave me great content, Josh. I wanted to follow up there with the point you made, and then you threw the curveball, and I'm glad you did to get my final four picks. But just on the development piece alone, oh, yeah, last thought for you. Here's yeah. another thing. Last offseason, talking about curveballs, Emil Jefferson goes to the Boston Celtics, yep. right? And then the coaching staff is shifted at the last – right? So the le- we haven't even talked about – people are all of a sudden only wanting to focus on what the players look like going into next year. Can John Shire keep the same staff for another yeah. year? And if, if if someone like Jay Lucas gets a gets an opportunity to be a head coach, and he will, he, he absolutely will. will, then well deserved a big loss for Duke if that happens. But beyond that, like from a consistency standpoint, working with these players, like man, it'd be good to just have them back another year. Yeah, I mean the coaching staff is a it's a great question. Jay Lucas is a head coach. We'll see what happens with that, but he is he is also a major part of the Duke defensive strategy. And we've seen this year the Duke had an incredible defense. And so yeah, the coaching staff will be interesting. Like I said, there's a lot of intriguing things between April the first of April and the first of October, right? There's it's gonna be very interesting to see all the development. And as you mentioned, I believe here with here the, the next few days, we're going to start to see some of the movement. You know, obviously Flip's going to announce that he's gone. I think McCain's going to announce that he's gone. 
and then we'll have to see about everybody else. And I have yeah. no clue what that's going to look like. Yeah, and, and we'll just clear the air with everybody here. At the time that we're recording this, nobody has made Correct. any declaration at no. all. Obviously, being a YouTube show, if things happen before we record and publish, don't hold us for that. But at the yep. time of this recording, nobody has made any decisions like mm -hmm. that. So, Josh, yep. you're the best man. Thank you for the time, as always. Another basketball season that you and I completed. Football will be here before we know it. And uh, just so grateful for your time each and every week, man. JJ, have a great week, man. We'll see you. All right, that's Josh Cox joining us here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. Good stuff, as always, from him. Love the insight and conversation uh, and excited to continue that in the days and weeks to come here on Locked On Blue Devils. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.